You'd think with Ruby also having a red color inspiration, she'd fit right in in the Crimson Kingdom. But as we're going to find out in this episode, she's just as out of place here as she is in the rest of Ever After. But before I get into that, I will say spoiler warning for those who have not seen episode 3 of Ruby Volume 9. I won't be showing the episode or any clips from it in this video, simply images of the episode and analyzing the events that take place. I'll leave a link in the description below so you guys can go to Crunchyroll, watch the episode there, and support this amazing series. The episode begins as Team Ruby is being escorted to the Red King's birthday party by the soldiers that Ruby just traded Penny's sword to. Yang is a bit unsure whether they should actually be doing this, and Ruby is relenting herself to following the fairy tale. The Red King helped Alex, and Weiss points out that they aren't Alex. So it seems that Weiss and Yang aren't exactly so sure about following the fairy tale, at least not as much as Blake is, and Ruby... I don't really think she's sure about following the fairy tale either, it's just she has no idea what else to do and everything else she's tried has just not worked out. So she's relented to just follow someone else's path. And then they arrive at the Crimson Palace and they are introduced not to the Red King, but the Red Prince, who is, uh, well, a royal pain in the butt to say the least. Now I would call him high and mighty, but I would say he's just short and arrogant. He's a small little boy that has an ego the size of the castle behind him. And as Team Ruby are introduced to him, they ask where the Red King is. And apparently, he's not there. He's disappeared. As one of the soldiers speaks up, saying that if it wasn't for your kind, the Red King would still be here. The rest of the soldiers speak up trying to shut him up, so apparently this is something that they're not supposed to talk about, whether it's taboo for some reason, or it's just something that would upset the little princeling, we're not exactly sure, or it's not made clear as of yet, but when the soldier says if it's not for your kind, meaning that someone resembling Team Ruby, or at least the humans that they are, caused the Red King's disappearance in the past. Something that is almost certainly related to Alex and the fact that she lied and cheated her way through the story, probably something happened to the Red King afterwards that wasn't exactly shown in the story. But we just don't know at this time. After the prince's little tirade and being insulted that Team Ruby has no idea who the prince is, even though they come to his castle on the day of his birthday, they all wish him a happy birthday. And the two soldiers kind of push Team Ruby aside to present the prince with the gift that they got, that only they got. They had no help in getting, which, you know, Weiss tries to speak up, but they kind of push her to the side. And they present the blade of the greatest warrior to the prince. And initially, the prince is quite intrigued by this gift that has been brought to him. Until he sees it, that is. And sees the color of it, more specifically. It's green! And apparently, that color just doesn't vibe with the prince, as he kicks it aside. Ruby tries to run after it, but the soldiers stop her, and she seems really hurt by the prince's actions. Which makes sense, considering that blade is a representation, or a remnant, of a very close friend of hers. Not that it really matters to the prince, though, in his arrogant nature. And I really wonder why exactly it's green that he hates so much. Because that's the color of the sky above him. Green is, like, half of the scenery in this acre, in this little area of the world. So, does he just not want anything green other than the sky because he can't actually change the sky? I know that red is opposite to green on the color wheel, but would he have been insulted if something of any other color other than red was brought to him? I'd imagine he probably would have been fine with the golden scepter that was Yang's arm because it would kind of match his crown, but who knows? He seems uh, very picky in his choice of things. And because those two soldiers insulted him by bringing something green, well, immediately, off with their heads. They get dragged away and literally beheaded. The prince is certainly not one for his mercy, but Ruby has an idea to cheer him up. She hears that he likes games, and so they go to the central chamber, or what looks like the central chamber, of the Crimson Palace, where there is a game board set up in the middle of it. Ruby sits on one side, and the prince sits on the other, but the prince is no fool. Obviously, he realizes that when someone challenges him to a game, they always want something. And so, Ruby says that they want to go to the tree. The prince is kind of complaining about how far away it is, but eventually relents and agrees to take on this game. So then Ruby asks, well, what are the rules of the game? Which causes the prince and all of the soldiers to burst out laughing. Probably because you come to challenge the game but have no idea how to play it, 
and then the prince explains the rules. As we see, there are pieces scattered across the chessboard, white and red, and they all start getting up as the king is listing the rules, which are as follows. First, a player can move every pawn one space each turn. And second, the winner is determined by whoever can get the most pawns to the other side of the board. And the last rule is that to occupy a space, you must dispose of whoever is on it already. At which point, the red pawns stand up, ready for battle. And so do the white pawns, who look like they'd rather be anywhere else. Each of the white pawns have scars on their bodies, chunks missing from them, so you can obviously tell which side is used to being disposed of, especially since there is nary a scratch on the red pieces. The prince always wins. The child always gets his way. After the pieces assemble, Ruby sees a couple open spaces and mentions to the prince that she's missing a few pieces. So the prince says it's lucky for her that she brought friends along. And the prince uses his own power to shrink down Weiss, Blake, and Yang to take those spots on the table. They become players in the game. And Ruby asks, is anyone going to be hurt? To which the prince simply smirks and says that since he's such a benevolent ruler, he'll let the white pieces move first. And so Ruby sends in a pawn as a test subject of sorts. The pawn walks forward to try to occupy the space that a red pawn is on and immediately gets overwhelmed by the red pawn. Even when the white pawn looked like it was about to stand up again, it looked at the prince, who signaled for it to play dead. And so, the white pawn was carried off of the board, and we can see it start relaxing on the magical stretcher that was carrying it away. The prince rigged the game. The pawns each have wills of their own, and the prince is in control of all of them, instructing the white ones to lose, while the red ones can just trample over them. Ruby tries again with three more of the white pawns, and they're swiftly defeated and carried off the board. So then she uses her unique pawns, that being Weiss, Blake, and Yang, and they have a little bit more success. Weiss goes first and quickly disposes of the red pawn in front of her, which causes the prince some frustration, and he also starts asking Ruby some questions, starting with, why do you want to go to the tree? Ruby says, well, we want to go home and we think the tree can get us there. And then she sends Yang forward, who again makes quick work of a red pawn. The prince grows more frustrated. And the prince asks another question. How do you know this? Ruby simply says, oh, I work for someone we know. And then she sends Blake forward, who once again makes quick work of a red pawn. And the prince is growing ever more frustrated because now the tables are almost even. He is beginning to lose. But he's also suspicious of Ruby's answer. Someone you know, huh? And with Blake, Weiss, and Yang actually winning against the red pawns, the morale of the white pawns is starting to improve. They start whispering amongst themselves, maybe we can actually win for once. Okay, what are your orders? And they start looking to Ruby, and Ruby just says, okay, we'll move forward. And they all charge forward and are actually able to start defeating some of the red pawns. The prince still getting more and more frustrated that it's not going his way. And so he says it's his turn and sends all of his forces forward, to which the white pawns, Blake, Weiss, and Yang included, are able to push them back. The prince is losing quite handily now, and just like every other classy royal that exists, he's gonna cry about it, or at least throw a tantrum and be dramatic. So he kicks his chair over, storms behind him, drops to his knees, and has a spotlight on him as he's saying, this is not fair, you're cheating, there's something's going wrong, I'm supposed to win but also something piques his interest. He then turns to Team Ruby and he says, what kind of creatures are you again? And Ruby answers, well, Blake is a Faunus, Little's a mouse, right? And Little's just like, I guess. And the three of us are human. And this is where we see the prince's face crack, the same image that we saw in the trailers previously. When he finds out that they are humans, he snaps, both literally and figuratively. Even the pawns themselves, each of them with their own will and personalities, it seems, were shocked at hearing Ruby say the word human. So, obviously, humans aren't looked on too fondly, probably because of previous experiences with humans. In other words, Alex. Or maybe others came to the Ever After at some point as well, it's just Alex's was the only one that was recorded. Regardless, 
the prince orders all of the pawns, both red and white, to destroy them, to attack Weiss, Blake, and Yang. And this leads to, honestly, a pretty fun battle sequence. Weiss, Blake, and Yang start taking out the pawns, but do start to get overwhelmed by the numbers at one point in the battle. Ruby looks like she's about to give in to despair, but then just says, no, it's time to kick their butts. And then they each activate their semblances, and we get to see a few new moves from Team Ruby. Weiss uses her gravity glyphs to allow Blake to run even upside down as she's trying to escape the pawns that are chasing her. And she also uses her summon to create wings behind herself. These are never more wings, and she uses those to throw feathers down at the pawns on the ground. This is a summon we did see her use in Volume 8, as she was about to summon the Nevermore against the Senatar at the Shni Manor. But two Sentinels interrupted her from making that summon. Still, this looks like it's going to be a recurring summon from here on, and the fact that Weiss can now do partial summons much more efficiently. I don't know if she was actually able to summon the wings on her back. It certainly looked like that. So if she can summon parts of Grimm onto her own body, that creates some interesting ideas for the future. If she can summon the Armagigas armor around herself, or possibly summon, I know she doesn't have a Beowulf summon, but if she could summon like a Queen Lancer stinger on her arm and have just a lance or something like that. Like the possibilities that this opens up are quite interesting. Winter, if she could master the same type of ability, she could summon a Beowulf arm or something like that. Things could get quite interesting with aura summons if you can incorporate them in different ways. Though if Weiss is able to make those angel wings and she would actually be able to fly around, then why hasn't she done that before? That might've been very useful in actually surveying the land where they are and trying to you know, make it to the tree. Maybe she didn't want to waste aura or something like that. Regardless, still very cool. Yang is able to burst forth from the pawns that were pinning her down thanks to her semblance and, and also Weiss taking a few of them out with the feathers that she was firing down. And now comes a new combo move between Weiss, Blake, and Yang. Weiss uses two gravity glyphs to hold herself and Blake in the air. And then Blake tosses over her weapon to have, similar to in Volume 1, where she created a slingshot using the Ribbon of Gamble Shroud, and Yang jumps up with her semblance, lands in the ribbon to get slingshot downward. But before she does, Weiss summons the Armagigas sword. Yang grabs onto it, charged by her semblance, she gets launched down to the ground and slams the blade downwards. This causes a shockwave that sends all the pawns flying, and Weiss, Blake, and Yang are the only ones left standing. Since they were on Ruby's side, Ruby is declared the winner. And the prince takes this about as well as you would expect. He flips the table and orders his soldiers to take their heads. Great sportsmanship. But overall, this game, probably not really the most functional game to exist because the rules were quickly thrown out the window. Oh, each pawn can only move one space? Well, it just turned into all-out war, and whoever's pawns took out the opposing pawns would be the winner. If all pawns were created equal, then, you know, it would just be a brawl to the end. But obviously, with the Red Prince's influence, the game would always be won by the Prince. And the Prince's mistake in this game was, instead of giving Ruby three more pawns, he ended up giving her an extra knight, bishop, and rook more powerful pieces than the prince even had on the board to begin with. So Ruby was a shoe in to win from the beginning. But I do see some similarities here to a game played in No Game No Life, which I cover on my second channel, where in a chess match that each of the pieces on the board have their own will and are heavily influenced by the charisma of the leader who's ordering them around. Though, in this case, it's also the royal prince, so they kind of have to follow the orders, but they are still quickly willing to turn on the prince if it means they could possibly win the game. Maybe they could win for once, and that is due to their overall morale being boosted. Something very similar to the game in No Game No Life as well. So if you're interested in hearing more about that game, then check out the link in the description below to my second channel. But at this point, with the prince in a rage, this is when the Curious Cat, or the Cheshire Cat character, shows up saying, oh, I'm sure you must be frustrated, Prince. You are unable to do the one thing you were put on this acre to do. We saw the eyes of the cat appear behind Ruby when she mentioned that they were humans. And so the cat makes his appearance now to save these humans from the Prince's wrath. But the words that were spoken are interesting, that the Prince was put 
on this acre for that one purpose, to win these games. Who put the prince on this acre? Who is in control of the Ever After? Questions are being raised by the events that are happening, and we don't yet have the answers or too many hints to them. We might get a couple later in this episode, though. But for now, the cat seems to have his own powers, as he manipulates the prince into letting Team Ruby go, by literally seeming to use some of those pixels that the cat is created from to actually almost grasp the prince's heart and momentarily make him a bit more gentle. He says, fine, I'll let them go, but I never want to see them again, and then drops to the floor screaming and kicking and crying, and his tears seem to be turning into little pearls almost. And at this point, the cat goes to Team Ruby and says, uh, yeah, we should probably leave before he changes his mind, which he does almost immediately as Ruby runs after the cat, the, the prince sends all of the soldiers after Ruby. And this is when we see the chase scene that also appears in the Ruby Volume 9 trailer, as the Crimson Castle seems to twist and bend and turn in all sorts of different ways. The running on the sides of the walls, there are doors in the floor, and they're trying to escape the soldiers and eventually find the way out thanks to the curious cat. They end up in a crawl space almost, just big enough for the cat and Ruby to crawl on all fours to get out of, and Ruby is at first sitting there wondering how things went so wrong. Well, it was because Ruby was trying to fill the role of Alex when none of them are actually her, and things are very different in the Ever After. The cat then begins to ask some questions. How did they get to the party? And when they mention the Red King, he's very interested in how they know him. And then the cat simply says that times change, you know, and so do we, when it is our time to change. Don't you? Heavily implying that it is time for, at the very least, Ruby herself, if not her entire team, to change. They are going to have to go through growth, they are going to have to go through development, something that we've known for a very long time. But a couple of the things that the cat has said, this phrase in particular, and one phrase that it said earlier when Ruby pointed at the prince saying, hey, my friends are still small, he promised to let us go to take us to the tree, and the cat simply says, promises are like birds, taste great, but they always escape. Which, in other words, promises when they are kept are momentary bliss, but they often get away from you and are hard to hold onto, hard to keep promises. Which ties directly into the theme of the past couple volumes, that idea of trust, that you can trust someone to hold to their word and keep their promises. Well, the prince obviously isn't one of those characters, and again, trust is probably going to be explored in this volume and how it comes about with different promises that are made. So I'm curious to see if there are any specific scenes in the rest of the volume in the next seven episodes where someone specifically promises something, because that'll probably be pretty significant. They are then hit by a flash of light and somehow transported out of the crawl space they were in back into the forest outside. We don't see the Crimson Castle in the background, so we don't know how far they were transported, but it seems like they're a decent ways away, at least a place that is now safe. And thanks to the cat's words about things changing, they begin to realize that they aren't actually in Alex's story. As Weiss put it, they are in the sequel because the Red King is no longer there, the Red Prince is there instead. This is something I pointed out in the episode 2 review when it was noted that Jinxie looked older than what he did during Alex's story. Things have progressed, time has moved forward in the Ever After, yet somehow Team Ruby are following the same events as Alex, and yet different. Everyone is in the same place that they were during Alex's story, but they're older. And in the case of the Red King, he's not there, but his kid is. So things are not going to work the same. They're realizing that they're not in the exact same fairy tale, but also are. Things are going to get interesting from here on out. Especially now that they've encountered the curious cat, who tries to ask Ruby some questions, like, what are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? And he finds Ruby's answers just boring, and so is distracted by butterflies and insects that are flying around. Blake realizes, though, that this is the curious cat, likely the same one that Alex ran into and helped her reach the tree. So Ruby runs after the cat, trying not to lose it. But obviously, they need to keep the cat's attention. The cat is the curious cat, 
And because of that, you need to be able to keep its curiosity. If you give boring answers, if you aren't someone interesting, then the cat's not going to take any interest in you. Something that'll probably come up later. But this isn't actually the end of the episode. There is a couple more things that happen. We see the Jabberwalker running out of what seems to be the Land of Light into the Land of Darkness, with a bridge in between them. Heavily reminiscent of the Gods of Light and Darkness, to say the least, so maybe they do have some influence on this world. As the Jabberwalker runs into the Land of Darkness, we see it cut itself on some of the plants that are there. They seem to have razor leaves that are able to cut through its flesh pretty easily, and it seems to be searching for something else. It says the word fix as it picks up what looks like it might be a, a gear or something from the ground, not really sure, and it tosses it behind itself. So is it searching for something to help fix something else? Not entirely sure. Not that it matters much at this point though, as we see a pink stream of light come from behind the Jabberwalker and crash into the ground. And this is Neo arriving in the Ever After. So anyone who thought that the order in which people fell actually played a factor, it doesn't really seem to be the case if Team Ruby was already here and Neo is just arriving now. Unless, of course, this ending scene with Neo is showing when she arrived in the Ever After and made contact with the Jabberwalker and then everything that we saw in Episode 1 where Team Ruby encountered the Jabberwalker was something afterwards. We'll have to wait and see if that's the case, but if Neo arrived after Weiss did, then the order in which they fell really plays no factor. And that would also mean that Weiss looking for Gamble Shroud based on the fact that it fell after Blake but before her, like, the things aren't exactly lining up here and we're gonna need uh, more points along the timeline to have it make sense. When Neo lands though, she's pissed off. This is the scene that we were shown in the Ruby Volume 9 trailer as well as the teaser that we got a few months back. Neo is angry. She uses her semblance to turn into Ruby and then she uses her semblance to turn into Cinder. Now she has two targets, not just Ruby anymore, she's also out to get Cinder. And the Jabberwalker approaches Neo, and Neo turns towards the Jabberwalker, and her semblance is interacting with the world itself. We can see it kind of flow down Neo's legs into the ground and outwards. And it doesn't seem like Neo is doing this intentionally, as from her semblance, as it's radiating outwards, clones of Neo start to rise up, and Neo is a bit confused seeing this. Each of the clones seem to mimic her behavior. As she looks right, she's confused, all the clones look right and look left, and then Neo snaps her fingers and all of the clones obey. They surround the Jabberwalker as it's saying, no, like, please stop. Like, it doesn't want to be overwhelmed, but Neo is obviously doing so. And then we see Neo smirk, and this is where the episode ends. So, that entire idea of this being Neo's world seems to be kind of accurate. Maybe she didn't create the entirety of the world, but she certainly has a great deal of influence over it. Her semblance does interact with the world, as she's able to create clones of herself. Probably those shadows that appear behind Neo in the opening are things created from her semblance, and she's probably going to have control over the Jabberwalker if she's able to overwhelm it. She can use it to do her bidding and she is probably going to be put into a position of power in this world in some way, shape, or form. It's also notable that when Neo landed in the Ever After, she had her hush, her parasol, with her. Cinder kicked that into the void separate from her. Blake lost her weapon and had to find it. Ruby lost her weapon and still has not found it. And yet Neo's weapon, when it fell into the void separate from herself, has it when she falls. Why? I wonder if that's going to be explained, or maybe, since Ruby and Neo were able to fall through the void together, even though they fell separately, maybe Neo found Hush in the void? I have a feeling we won't get an explanation for that, but we'll see. Regardless of Neo having her weapon, though, just this last scene shows us a lot. There is a land of darkness, and the Ever After that Team Ruby is currently in it seems to be a land of light. Neo's semblance has an effect on this world, seemingly unintentional from herself. Whether that's because her own emotions are driving that, whether the world is responding to her emotions, or whether it's just the nature of her semblance, that it is a semblance that creates physical illusions, is allowing her to do this. 
things will definitely need to be explained, and we don't have that much information right now, but it makes me look forward to the future episodes that much more. And I would love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. What did you think about the interactions with the Red Prince? Team Ruby finally realizing that the world has changed since Alex's time. The Red King is no longer there. Whether he's alive or not, maybe captured, maybe that's something that Team Ruby will have to do in the future. They will have to right the wrongs that Alex committed in that world. So... It could be fixing the mistakes of Alex's story. That is the purpose that they are currently on. There are certainly a number of ways that this could unfold. Another notable thing about this episode and the episodes prior is the way that Little is reacting to the different emotions that Ruby is feeling. When Ruby had her hands on her head, about to give in to despair during the game against the Red King, Little mimicked that motion exactly. And Little seems to have mimicked Ruby at various other times. When Ruby is excited or fired up, so is Little. I think Little does actually represent Ruby's innocence in a way. And when Ruby is left alone with her own thoughts and kind of giving in to despair, Little is sleeping because the child in Ruby is no longer present. And it's making me wonder about that younger version of Ruby that she'll be confronted with later in the volume. If that is actually Little manifesting into Ruby's innocence, or something like that. Because Little does have some connection to Ruby, and that's going to play a factor moving forward. But we'll have to wait to find out. Now that we've met the Red King, though, or rather the Red Prince, it is now time for the adventure with the Curious Cat that will be the focus of next episode. And I'm wondering if they're going to do one episode for the Red King, one episode for the Curious Cat, and then the following episode, episode 5 of Ruby Volume 9, is one will meet the Rusted Knight, because those are the next three events in the course of Alex's story. And then it'll kind of be unknown for the last five episodes. Maybe that's the way it'll unfold? I'd love to know your thoughts on it, but uh, from here on out, things are going to get more and more interesting now that Neo has entered the fray. But that'll be next week's episode. So if you guys enjoyed this video, want to see more like it, make sure to subscribe and join the Guild of the Eternal Flame. As I mentioned, if you're interested in No Game No Life, feel free to subscribe to my second channel as well, The Daily Flugel. And if you guys want to see some games played live, make sure to check out my Twitch channel. I stream every Tuesday and Saturday. So with that being said, I'll see you guys in the next video.